likely to be in one of these dictionaries. Now, let's say you have a high degree of entropy. Does that mean you have an uncrackable password? Possibly. If both you and the site owner do everything correctly, you can have a pretty high degree of confidence. Uh, you don't have control over the site owner, unfortunately, so we have to focus on what you can do, but there are things you can't do. Again, bear in mind, any change in technology could affect this. So, for instance, the NSA built a huge facility in Utah that is capable of storing an immense amount of data. And the best evidence I've been able to find says what they're doing is they're storing all sorts of web traffic that they can't read right now, but they think they will be able to read in five or ten years with improved technology. That's probably not a bad bet. Those are smart people. Now, I'm not really focusing on how to protect myself against the NSA. They're, they're a government agency. Uh, what I really am more concerned with, and this is what I focus on, I don't want my bank account drained. I don't want my personal health information revealed. I don't want my identity stolen. All right? That's the stuff that I'm really focused on. Um, if, if there's something about your lifestyle that means you have to worry about government agents, um, I'm probably not going to be the person that's going to help you on that one. Because uh, that's, that's just an awful lot harder. Um, it's basically, w when you're dealing with the government, it's like all they need is for you to make one mistake. And at some point, everyone makes one mistake. So I'm not going to worry about that. So protecting myself against the kind of threats that I really am concerned with, number one, don't reuse passwords. Right? This is the most common mistake that people make. And crackers will get the passwords from one site, and then they'll just start trying them. They'll try them on various banks. And, you know, they don't have to succeed 100% of the time. They just have to succeed enough to make a profit. You know, have you seen an email that you, you start getting notices about uh, bank problems for banks that you don't even have an account with? Well... They just send out millions and millions of those and figure some percentage of people will have an account at that bank. And it just takes a few of them to click on the link for us to make money. So any site that is important should have a unique, strong password. And then it is probably, in my view, okay to have a standard password that is a throwaway for low value sites. My local newspaper has a website, and I wanted to post a comment, and they said, no, you got to create an account first. That's, that's not high value in my So, step number one, add to the entropy. So, avoid common names. All of those are going to be in the dictionary. Uh, there's a URL here that it is, a, and you know, you can find these sites with a web search. The, about once a year, someone will put out something that says, you know, here were the 20 worst passwords last year. And they figure it out because we get these thefts of these databases and people start taking a look at all of the passwords and say, hey, look at what these do. Now, for some reason, monkey is a very popular password. I don't know why. Uh, there's probably some deep-seated psychology. But, but here's the, the ironic one on this list is trust no one, which is a very good, if you're security conscious, is a very good
thing to be thinking about, but it's a lousy password. <laughs> you know, any word, any name is going to be in the dictionary. So, let's take a look at this. I'm going to do a little bit of math. I've actually done all the heavy lifting already. So, let's say you have a six character password made of random lowercase letters. There are 26 lowercase letters. There are six characters. So, the math says 26 raised to the sixth power, which is 308 million. That's how many different passwords you get with six lowercase letters. So, how good is that? Well, there's a thing called Bitcoin mining that works by calculating hashes, and it's a way of making money. So in other words, there are very strong incentives involved here. I have seen Bitcoin mining rigs, computers in other words, that are capable of generating 800 billion hashes per second. So. My 308 million combination can be checked in a very small fraction of a second. So that's not going to get me anywhere. Well, let's add to it. Suppose we have upper and lower case. Now that's 52 potential characters. 52 to the sixth power is 19 billion. That's still a lot less than 800 billion. Add in the numbers. We're now up to 62. 62 to the 6th power is 57 billion. Add in the special characters, 95. There are 95 characters on a keyboard. 95 to the 6th power, 700 billion. That's still less than a second on a Bitcoin mining rig. In other words, entropy alone won't solve the problem. Not these days. So, a security expert by the name of Steve Gibson coined the term password haystacks. Now, he used haystacks as a name because he said if you're searching for a needle in a haystack and you want to make it really hard, make the haystack bigger. Right? So, that approach says length is really the only thing that matters. So, Gibson said that this particular password is actually secure as long as the cracker doesn't know how it was generated because it's so long even though it really all you'd have to remember is how many periods P-A-S-S -S, and then how many periods and if you can count you can do that so how does that work then? well suppose you create a password of 30 characters you use all 95 keyboard characters it becomes a complicated calculation well we already saw a Bitcoin mining rig the reports I saw said 800 billion let's round it up to a trillion a trillion is 10 to the 12th All right. but for my 30 characters my total was 10 to the 50, two times 10 to the 52nd power. So, how long would it take a Bitcoin mining rig to go through all of those passwords? Well, you can do a little math and say, well, let's first take the number of seconds, in, you know, and then one year has that many seconds, and so it's that many years. What you basically come down to is a Bitcoin mining rig would take something like a trillion, trillion, trillion times the length of the, uh, the uh, history of the universe to complete the calculation. And that is what we mean by computationally infeasible. So length really does matter more than just about anything. And this is why it's really bad to be dealing with sites that say your password cannot be more than X number of characters. They're building in insecurity. It's not a good thing. 
Now, one of the things that people came up with, and a few years ago it made sense, was say, ah, well, let's combine those. We need to be able to remember the password, but length is what really matters. So let's just uh, string four or five words together. And that gives us length, and if the words are completely unrelated, potato, hopscotch, <laughs> you know, stuff like that, uh, what's the problem? Well, the problem is, you know, the hackers are keeping up with all of this stuff, too. So they know <coughs> that they now have to put together combinations of words into their dictionary. So this was an article in Ars Technica. Someone used as a password, there is no fate but what we make. Seems like a, a long password. And then they showed how fast it was to crack. So, so where does that leave us? The only way to guarantee, at least at the present time, that your password cannot be cracked is to have it both long and random. Now, there's this thing called quantum computing that they like to talk about, and oh, you know, when quantum computers come in, that's going to blow all of this stuff out of the water. My approach to this is, well then, researchers will figure out how to use quantum computing to come up with a new form of cryptography. And we'll find ways to make this work. I'm not, that's not anything I'm worried about. Um, now what might happen is older data that had been secure will suddenly become insecure, but I'm not going to worry about that. Long and random is what we're looking for. So, everyone needs long random passwords which by definition means they are difficult, if not impossible, to remember. Uh, passwords are, I would say, just about the worst possible way of securely authenticating people. Because they're, they have all of these security problems. So, how do we deal with that? We have to find ways of getting away from relying on passwords, first of all. And there's a number of them. The first one for an important asset is two-factor authentication. Now, the way two-factor authentication works, and, and here's how the security people will talk about it, there are three types of authentication. Something you know, something you have, and something you are. Two-factor is any two of those three things. So, something you know would be a password or a PIN. I mean, a PIN is just a numerical password, right? Not anything tricky. You know, sometimes see people play, you know, password plus PIN is two-factor. No, that's one factor. <laughs> just using two passwords is essentially what that is. Uh, something you have could be uh, a, a fob that you carry around, like an RSA token or something like that, that uh, generates a one-time password to get you into something. That's considered to be something you have. But nowadays, the best one is your phone. Because most of us carry a phone around with us. Now, uh, Gib is holding up his uh, badge from Ford. That's another one. You would. They have little chips in them, so the credit cards now have those too. Right. So to get access to the building, uh, you would have to have your badge to get uh, get into the building. Uh, yeah, it could be a combination. Yeah. Because basic ATM cards are two-factor authentication. Yes, the card is what you have, and the PIN is what you know. So yes, that would be two-factor. Now something you are might be. Uh, Fingerprint, retinal scan, something like that. Researchers are constantly coming up with things. Um, there's a technology right now that they are claiming that they can identify people uniquely by the way they walk. Huh. All right. 
And we know that, that face identification technology has been making great strides. So, you know, th the thing is, don't just rely on a password if you can help it. Now, with, with two-factor, uh, for instance, um, Google. Now, I use Gmail. Uh, I like Gmail. But I'm sure it, it, this is available on all major platforms. But with Gmail, um, I have turned on the second factor. And what that means is, if I am sitting at a computer that I have not accessed Gmail on previously, and I try to log into my Gmail account, it sends something to my phone, a six-digit number that I have to type in before it's going to let me get in to see my Gmail. Now, I only have to do that once on any given computer. Um, my website, I've actually got several of them, but I got uh, Duo Security as a, a company that offers uh, a free for personal use. Uh, and so if I go to log into my website because I want to post some information or something like that, um, I have to have something pushed to my phone that I can then, on my phone, say, yes, I am authorizing this. I'm confirming this is a legitimate login. So that way, that notorious ne'er-do-well give back there cannot log into my website and post Kevin is a schmuck, which I know he wants to do. <laughs> um, and so there's a number of these. Uh, YubiKey is another one. So, uh, you know, I like the stuff that, that goes through your phone because we all, just about everyone has a phone, you know, so it, it's not an additional thing that you have to carry around, but there's a number of those. So, Kevin, I was concerned about putting my personal phone number into Google, since so that now is putting it somewhere where people can, you know, might be able to hack in and get a hold of it. That's true. So, you're more worried about Google getting hacked than your Gmail getting hacked. I, and if, if, if that's what keeps you up at night, then yeah. I happen to think Google is less likely to get hacked than my account is. So, um, now, the, the next thing, if, you know, from the standpoint of passwords, there are programs uh, and I'm going to mention a couple of them. Um, they're, they're not exactly the same. Uh, LastPass and KeePass. And, and keep, there's a KeePass and a KeePass X. Um, these will both generate passwords for you and store them for you. And allow you to insert them into things. So the idea of a password vault uh, I would say is the principle, keep all your eggs in one basket and then watch that basket. Okay. So, for LastPass, I have a very strong password that I've memorized. It's the only really strong password that I have to memorize. Because what happens, when I have LastPass, LastPass installs as an add-on with all of the major browsers. So you can see Chrome, Firefox, Safari, Internet Explorer, um, I think Opera, uh, so you know, certainly all of the major ones. It integrates with Duo Security and with YubiKey. It can automatically log you into a site. The information is encrypted on your machine using AES-256, which is a very strong, reliable encryption. So there is, there is data being held in the cloud, as they call it, but it's encrypted data. And it's encrypted on your machine. So even if the government gave LastPass a subpoena, LastPass could say, I'm Sorry, I mean, I can give you the encrypted blob, but that's the best I can do. I don't have access to anything. So it's your password that's really the key, because your password is what's used to do the encryption. Um, 
So if you lose your password and you suddenly can't remember what it is, you have lost all of that data. That happened to my wife recently. And she was pretty new to LastPass. She was like, oh, I forgot my password. And she was like, yeah, guess what, honey? You are out of luck. <laughs> Unfortunately, she hadn't stored everything there yet. Uh, but, you know, I've got a couple of hundred items in LastPass. So what happens is I go to a site and uh, in my browser, and up pops the login for, let's say, for Facebook. LastPass sees that and says, oh, I have Facebook. I have an entry for that here in LastPass. I'll just fill in your login name and password for you. So that means I can have one of those really secure passwords and not have to worry about, can I memorize it? So I really like this idea of, of password vaults, like LastPass. Um, and you can, if you wish, at any point, just open up the vault and go in and, and take a look individually at your entries and edit them and do whatever you, you need to do. Now, the thing about LastPass is that it's all about online connections. And that's probably 95% of what most people care about. But there is the other thing. Sometimes you need to have access to information, and you're not online. And one of my favorites is, uh, I have a Wi-Fi router in my home. So, you know, my wife and I can get online, and we can walk around with our laptops and tablets and what have you, and it's very convenient. But I don't want it to be wide open to everyone in the world. So it is secured with a very strong password. Um, and it, it's one of those random ones that has upper and lowercase letters and numbers and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, and I remember once I was out of town and my wife sent me an email and, you know, said, hey, I, I, I need the password. And it was like, okay, I'm going to have to figure out a way to get it out of the password vault and stick it into an email and send it back to you because I can't just tell you over the phone what it is. It's way too complicated. <laughs> now, uh, where do I have that stored? If I store it in LastPass, I've got a chicken and egg problem. LastPass is great when I'm online, but I need my Wi-Fi password to get online. And plus, you know, what happens if, uh, you know, LastPass goes down or something? You know, I want to have a backup. So I actually keep two password vaults. And the thing with KeePass or, or KeePassX, the only difference, KeePassX is the Linux version. KeePass without the X is the Windows version. For otherwise, they're the same. Um, and that stores your passwords locally in an encrypted database. And again, the security of that is about as good as the password you put on that database. So this is, again, have one really good password that you use for that database, and then let the database keep everything else. Um, so, those are the two things I use. So, our recommendations. All right. When I wrote this, it was 2014. Now it's 2015. But my recommendation hasn't changed. Use long random passwords, and then use a password vault like LastPass or KeePass or both, and, and I use both. And this was the classic example from a, a comic <coughs> called XKCD. And at the time, it was correct horse battery staple as four random words. And when he wrote this, that was probably pretty good advice, but not anymore. <laughs> so we really need random. And 
and that's not random enough. So, questions? No? So other techniques, I'm sorry, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, I use LastPass too, and I'd probably go above and beyond maybe what normal people would do, but I also have it, since it has a little password generator feature in it where it'll generate random passwords for you, so you don't have to come up with one yourself. You can mm -hmm. say, I need something that's 32 characters long and I need special characters and this and that. Mm -hmm. I also use that same thing for my usernames. So I'll have it generate my username, which is a bunch of yeah. gibberish, password, a bunch of gibberish. <laughs> but, it might be too far. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, if, if Depends on the site. For a lot of sites, they want you to log in with your email address. Right. So you don't have the option of creating the username. Do you think websites, do they salt and hash your username too, or is it just your password? Uh, as far as I know, it's just the password. I have not seen anyone trying to do encryption on usernames. So I was going to say, I've heard some other techniques one of which is to take like a famous phrase to be or not to be and pick like the first letter of each word and stuff like that but I'm sure even that if you're using a real common phrase and a real common type of algorithm like that it's going to be hacked too mm -hmm. right you know. yeah I, I mean I think there, there's there's no substitute for entropy I, I what this gentleman said I, I think makes the most sense to me you use something either LastPass or KeePass either one will be very good at generating a really random password for you um, and then storing it for you. And you can even uh, you can even set them to expire at some point if you need to. Or, uh, Do you have the ability to export your database on LastPass? Yeah, I believe you do. Um, of course, that would present a security well, so export, I would think, you know, you, so you have it on your phone. Can you, like, back it up on another device in case the phone, you know, is damaged or lost? Well, at that point in time, with, with LastPass, if you have it on your phone, you automatically have an account that's accessible from pretty much any PC. Or mm -hmm. Okay, so LastPass that's stores your, your encrypted database on their server okay. in the cloud. All right, so it's accessible from any device. If I lose one device, I can then start right. and connect to so that account from another device, as long as I know the password. All you have to have is the password. Yeah, okay. Now, as I mentioned, my wife ran into this problem where she forgot the password. I ran into a problem. I, um, I, I don't remember why this was. I decided I could have an even more secure password for LastPass than the one I had, and I changed it. And like a couple of days later, it's like, I can't remember what it is. And what they had uh, was, we have a previous database with a different password, do you want to try that? And I remembered my previous password, okay. so it was like, okay, I didn't really lose anything. I had a uh, I get quite a few um, of these uh, phishing, mm -hmm. and, I'm not, I'm, and I may not be using the right term right. for your purpose, but mm -hmm. I call it just phishing. Mm -hmm. I get one, uh, and, and I go to great lengths mm -hmm. to help uh, security people and when I get one. I got one two days ago, mm -hmm. and this one was a phone call which I've gotten before, right. but it was kind of insidious because every once in a while on your computer, when you're computing, you'll get a pop-up that said uh, Windows has uh, got some sort of scripts deal, and mm -hmm. you get a choice after you decide that you want to either download the Windows updates or you've got some sort of internal issue, but anyway, this pop-up comes up on your desktop and says you've got a choice. You can forward it to Windows or Microsoft, etc. So sometimes I just eliminate the pop-up. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I send it, right? 
So it's kind of in your brain that, yeah, okay, you sent it. This has been going on for years. I get a phone call two days ago from a gentleman with a heavy accent, and he states that, uh, he says, uh, am I the primary user of the computer?